Okay. Uh, well, it is really my great pleasure to uh, address you here to introduce uh, today's winner of the PACE DB 2022 Rudolf Raff uh, Pioneer Award in Evolutionary Developmental Biology. Uh, it's a double pleasure because, uh, first of all, Rudy Raff was my own doctoral advisor, so it's an honor to be doing something in his name, uh, and also because the awardee this year, Leslie Pick, uh, is my dear colleague at the University of Maryland in College Park. Now, Leslie insisted that I tell you all that there were no COI shenanigans. Uh, I am the awards poobah at PASTB, uh, but I neither nominated her nor participated in the vote since she was on the slate, but I nevertheless heartily endorse her choosing. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, since some of you may not know much about uh, Rudy Raff, I, and because I'm in a position to tell you a little bit about him, I just wanted to take a second to tell you a bit about him. Um, Rudy spent his entire career at Indiana University as a PI, and although his early work was on the molecular biology of early embryos and sea urchins, he had a lifelong interest in evolution and fossils, and eventually, around the time he got tenure, decided to move into Evo Devo. Um, in the process of getting into that, he wrote a very influential book in 1983, which is what brought me to Bloomington and a lot of other people. Uh, he wrote later another book uh, that sort of started to summarize some of the first work of modern Evo Devo. So he was a drum beater and a real proselytizer for Evo Devo. Um, the main points he made in these books was that we needed to bridge phylogenetics and molecular biology to study gene level mechanisms of evolution and development. And he also struck, uh, stressed the need to do this in a phylogenetic context. And his own work in his lab used this specifically on sea urchins that include this um, unusual direct developing species here, Heliosideris erythrogramma. Um, so he made an impact as a, as, a, as a synthesizer and scholar and as a, as a researcher. Um, but also, those of us who worked with Rudy really appreciated his just tireless enthusiasm for natural history and evolution and biology. He was a great mentor, and a number of his uh, trainees are here at this meeting. Okay, with that little bit about Rudy, now I'm going to introduce uh, Leslie. So, uh, Leslie is the 2022 award winner of the Rudy Raff Pioneer Award. Um, she mentioned to me that her uh, initial foray into scholarship was in psychology, but she had a sort of change of heart and found herself in the lab of uh, Salome Gluckson Welsh, who's a real pioneer of developmental genetics. Uh, she then took a bit of a detour out of development and did her PhD in protein biochemistry with Jerry Hurwitz. So this is hardcore purification of proteins and their activ activation. Um, Having done that, she went back into development and in the famous shop of Walter Gehring in Basel began to work with Drosophila. Uh, she did a number of really seminal studies on segmentation in Drosophila, um, but by the early 90s was starting to turn her attention to comparative work on segmentation and evolution, and that's what she is going to be telling us about today. Um, I also want to mention that Oh, that she moved uh, to Maryland in 2003. That's when I got to know her, and she's been the chair of her department for the last 10 years and made innumerable contributions as a mentor and administrator as well as a scientist. So with that, I introduce you, Leslie, and congratulations. So since this is a, a sort of award about history um, in that it's a pioneer award, I thought that I'd give a talk a little bit different from my usual talk. and go back in time to our very first Evo Devo experiment when all we were working on in the lab was Drosophila, and I honestly would not have even known what any of these insects were at the time, although we're working on all of these in our lab right now. So if you'll bear with me to go back in time to this early experiment, I'd like, I'd like to bring you back to the time before some of you were in science or possibly even before some of you were born when Hox genes were first identified in the fruit fly, Drosophila, shown here at the top. And I know this, um, this schematic has been shown at least two other times at this meeting so far, so it's really classic. Uh, when these genes were cloned from Drosophila, it was found that these genes were conserved in other species, including mammals, including humans. And at the time, this was a very shocking result. And that's what I'd like you to, to try to appreciate. Um, it was found at the time that the genes were present in a cluster. It was known from Drosophila, but that these clusters were also found in other species, including mammals, as shown here. And the collinearity that's been discussed at this meeting was also conserved with the order of expression of genes along the anterior-posterior axis corresponding to the order of their location in the chromosomal complex. 
At the time, folks had been studying homeotic mutations in Drosophila, especially Ed Lewis and um, Kaufman, Tom Kaufman had been studying homeotic mutations. And one example is shown here, the antennapedia mutation that transformed the antenna into a leg, as shown here. These were considered totally bizarre mutations. There was absolutely no expectation on anyone's side that these genes would be at all relevant to any other organism, certainly not to mammals, and certainly it wasn't thought these would be biomedically relevant. So when these genes were cloned and this, this evolutionary conservation was found, people were totally surprised, and it changed the field a lot, in some ways launched the field of Evo Devo. So, in my lab, we were, we were looking at some of these Hox genes, and, and our question was, was, well, do these genes really retain function across taxa? So what I've shown on this slide here is um, for each of these genes, the black box represents the homeo box. This is a very short region of 180 base pairs encoding a DNA binding domain, and this is essentially the only part of the gene of these genes that's so strongly conserved. So when we compare gene sequences, most of the rest of the sequence is very, very different between orthologs and paralogs of these genes, but the homeobox is conserved. So we were wondering if the sequence, if the function could actually be conserved. And we took, um, we took an approach following the lead of Bill McGinnis, who was actually the first one who showed that these genes were conserved outside of Drosophila. Um, and we um, misexpressed an ortholog, in this case the ortholog of the Drosophila gene SCR, the mouse Hox A5 gene in flies. And what we found was that expression of this mouse gene in the head transformed the antenna to leg, and this is a perfect SCR-like leg caused by the octopic expression of the mouse HOXA5 gene. So this convinced us that actually the function of these genes had been conserved over this long evolutionary time since their divergence. Jack Zhao, the student in my lab who did this work, was also able to use this as an assay to dissect the, the parts of the protein that were important, and he found that, of course, the 180 base pair homeobox was essential, but also two other short sequence motifs that were conserved between Hox genes were also important, including the YPWM motif that I'll mention a little bit later in my talk. So, of course, this raised a lot of questions for the field. The Hox genes were shared. But yet these Hox genes pattern very diverse body plans across evolution, and a lot of folks are still working on that question. It turned out that in the lab we were working on one Hox gene, though, that was not that conserved. In fact, it had changed during evolution, and that's the Hox gene FUTS, shown here in the middle of the complex of Drosophila. It's present in protostomes, but it's actually absent in uh, many other lineages, including mammals. Now, in Drosophila, as a lot of you may know, it, Drosophila FUTS functions as a typical pair rule gene. It's expressed in seven stripes, as shown here in the primordia of the regions missing in FUTS mutant embryos. So here you see a wild-type embryo and a FUTS mutant missing every other body segment, a typical pair rule phenotype. So how did Drosophila FUTS become a pair rule gene? Drosophila FUTS is located in the Hox complex. It's in between two homeotic genes, SCR and Antenopedia. And we know that in order to become a, a, a peril gene, um, the expression pattern of FUTS had to change from a homeotic-like expression pattern to a typical seven-striped expression pattern. FUTS arose as an as a duplication, ancestral duplication that generated FUTS and Antenopedia. Antenopedia presumably retained the ancestral Hox function, allowing FUTS to diverge and function during evolution. But we wanted to know if FUTS protein also changed. Was it only its expression pattern that changed, or did its function change as a protein itself? So we use the same type of misexpression assay where we knew that if we express a Hox protein that is put it in the right place at the right time to mediate this homeotic transformation, express it in the head, we could generate an antennal to leg transformation. We could even do that for human Hox proteins or mouse Hox proteins in this case. So Uli Lohr, a graduate student in the lab, took on this project at the time and she expressed FUTS protein in the head. Here we see a control antenna when she expressed Drosophila FUTS protein in the head, there was no transformation of antenna to leg, only some cell death here. But when she took FUTS protein from the beetle, Tribolium, 
that, that generated a perfect antenna leg. In fact, this is a better antenna leg than Antennapedia, and it's an Antennapedia-like leg. The Futz protein from grasshopper also caused a homeotic transformation towards leg, although this transformation is weaker than the one caused by the beetle protein. Now, if I can draw your attention here to the right part of the slide for a moment, we in the lab had been studying for many years the biochemistry of how Futz protein works, trying to understand its specificity as a peril gene. And we had identified the partner of Futz, a protein called Futz F1, which is an orphan nuclear receptor. And Futz and Futz F1 form an obligate partnership and co regulate all of the genes that Futz regulates in segmentation. So all of the peril functions of Futz require the interaction with Futz F1. And what we noticed when we compared the different proteins that did or did not generate homeotic phenotypes was that all of the Futz proteins that did generate antenna legs or homeotic phenotypes retained this ancestral YPWM motif. That's one of those motifs that was, we could see in, in HOXA5 that I mentioned at the beginning. And this motif mediates the interaction with the protein partner extradenical. So together, Hox proteins and extradenical regulate homeotic target genes, and presumably the ancestral Futz protein regulated homeotic target genes as well. And many extant Futz proteins still do that as well. On its lineage towards Drosophila, Futz underwent a change of five amino acids to lose this YPWM motif and to gain an LXXLL motif that's necessary for its protein interaction with its partner Futz F1. So by switching these protein motifs, losing ability to interact with one partner and gaining an ability to interact with a different partner, Futz forms a different heterodimer that regulates a completely different set of downstream target genes. So that means that Futz changed in two ways during evolution. It changed in expression and it changed in protein function. And it was very hard for us, especially as Drosophila geneticists at that time, to understand how these changes could have happened. We know that if we make changes like this in the lab, we cause a lot of damage to the organism. Usually it's lethal. If not, it's extremely deleterious. Yet these changes happened. And we wondered which change happened first. If the protein change happened first, if Futz was changed from a homeotic protein to a peril-like protein or a segmentation-like protein, then there was a segmentation-like protein expressed in a homeotic pattern, and that would certainly be deleterious. And on the other hand, if the change in expression pattern happened first, there would be a homeotic-like protein expressed in peril stripes. So we decided to ask the question by looking in nature to see um, when and where this change happened during evolution. And again, I just want to emphasize that these changes are very slow and very rare because most changes to regulatory genes, especially gain of function changes, are highly deleterious. So Allison Heffer, a graduate student in the lab, took on this question of asking when and where Futz changed in its protein interaction domains and its expression pattern during evolution. And this slide summarizes a lot of work on the part of Allison. One thing that she found that was a very clear signal was that the LXXLL motif was acquired at the base of holometabola. All Futz proteins um, from holometabolous insects, and we have many more now, um, contain this LXXLL motif and thus have the potential to interact with the partner Futz F1. In contrast to that, the YPWM motif was lost multiple times during evolution, at least seven independent times during evolution. And this loss of function change makes a lot of sense because Antennapedia retained that ancestral Hox function, so Futz could lose that function without damage to embryogenesis. In terms of expression pattern, we see that Futz is still, in many extant species, expressed in a Hox-like pattern, as we can see here down here at the bottom part of this particular tree. And Futz is expressed in peril stripes in all holometabolous insects. Now, one thing we can see from this is that there are lots of different Futz proteins out there in the world. There are Futz proteins that have both the LXXLL and YPWM motif, presumably giving them the potential to be both a segmentation gene and a homeotic gene. We have proteins out there that have neither motifs, such as here in the hemipteran species. 
We have then other flux proteins that have one motif, as in Drosophila, only the LXXLL, or proteins that have only the YPWM motif, such as down here in more basally branching arthropods. We did wonder why was FUTS never lost from any of these genomes, and the answer to that seems to be that FUTS is expressed in the central nervous system in all species that have been examined, and it's likely that its role there is what is kind of retaining it in the genomes um, and preventing its loss. And interestingly, Allison showed in this paper that the role of FUTS in the central nervous system does not require either of those two motifs. It requires other parts of the FUTS protein, allowing all of the FUTS proteins out there in nature to still function in the central nervous system. So in light of all of this, it's important to remember that segmentation is a shared feature of all insects, but these changes in FUTS proteins suggested that the underpinnings vary during, um, out in nature and during evolution. So in Drosophila, FUTS is required for segmentation. In fact, it's required for viability. And part of its role is to directly regulate the expression of engrailed, which is shown here, a gene that's expressed in the primordia of every single segment in all arthropods that have been examined. So expression of engrailed is highly conserved throughout arthropods and certainly throughout all insects. Yet in many insects, segmentation is occurring and engrailed stripes are present without FUTs being able to do that job. So this raised a lot of questions for us. For example, how are engrailed stripes activated in species where FUTs can't do this? How was FUTs and other, or other genes incorporated into a new network and then made essential in that network? So FUTs is ex essential in the payroll network in Drosophila. But the question I got most often when I presented these data at the time was, is FUTs just an exception? People thought FUTs was, um, Mike Akam called it, a runaway Hox gene. Maybe it's just very special. Are other genes also changing in this network, in this peril network, or during evolution um, of or any of these embryonic regulatory genes during evolution? So in the last um, half, I still have half the time left, um, I'd like to give you a very brief overview of how we are trying to address a couple of these questions. Um, and I'll tell you that it's not only FUTs that has changed, we've also found other genes that have changed. And I'll start out by talking about another peril gene, the peril gene paired, which is pictured here. And this work was um, published relatively recently, um, done by Elise Jarvala, a former postdoc in my lab. So we can look at this abbreviated tree here where we um, have mosquitoes at the top. And what you can see is that this mosquito line here is lacking one of the colors. In fact, mosquitoes are lacking the paired gene. Elise wasn't able to identify the paired gene in any mosquito genome that, that she looked at. In contrast to that, Drosophila, of course, has paired. That's where it was identified. And paired is necessary for peril patterning. It's a standard peril gene. In fact, in more distantly related species, such as beetles, paired is also a peril gene and required for peril patterning. Yet mosquitoes seem to have lost paired. What you can also see on this slide is that paired has at least two family members that were also identified in Drosophila, gooseberry and gooseberry neuro. And these family members are present in the insects that are shown on this particular slide. Well, Marcus Knoll's lab had spent a lot of time working on paired. He was a good former colleague of mine at, um, in Basel, Switzerland, where I was a postdoc. And in Marcus Knoll's lab, they had shown that paired and gooseberry, family member, are redundant at the protein level in that they could rescue paired mutants by expressing gooseberry under the control of paired cis regulatory elements. So what Elise asked was if that same seamless handoff occurred between paired and gooseberry during evolution. In other words, did evolution do the same exact experiment as the Knoll lab had done and see if gooseberry could rescue paired? And that is, in fact, what she found. Um, Elise used, um, established in our lab, the um, Asian malaria mosquito vector, um, Anopheles stephensi, to do these experiments. And what Elise did first was look at the expression of Anopheles gooseberry. Um, first, I'll show you the expression um, in these two rows of the Drosophila gene. So Drosophila paired is expressed early in one stripe, and then in a typical pair rule pattern, it briefly transitions to 14 stripes and then fades. 
while Drosophila gooseberry is not expressed early, but at later stages is expressed in a 14-stripe pattern. And what Elise found was that in mosquito, gooseberry had merged the expression patterns of those two genes. So it presumably retained its ancestral 14-stripe pattern, but had taken on a paired-like pair rule pattern in this species. So this change in expression would give it the potential to substitute for paired in pair rule function. And Elise used CRISPR-Cas9 to generate a loss of function mutation in the Anopheles gooseberry gene. And what she found was that in these um, gooseberry mutants, every other engrailed stripe is missing, which is typical for what you expect for a parallel gene. And in fact, these mosquitoes had a typical parallel mutant phenotype with every other segment missing. And um, Elise was very careful and figured out how to identify individual segments in these mosquito embryos. So we could say definitively this was every other segment, exactly like a parallel mutant um, in Drosophila. So in this case, loss of an essential peril gene was enabled by a gain in expression of a family member. Gooseberry acquired the peril expression pattern. And the reason that this was, was evolutionarily possible, we believe, is that gooseberry binds the same DNA sequences as paired. So there were no negative effects of ectopic expression, expression in a new pattern of an unrelated transcription factor that likely would have activated genes in a way that was detrimental to embryos. So we see this as kind of a just right scenario. A new gene could come in and take over a function because it didn't activate new genes. Now, it did certainly change the level of expression of a, of a paired-like factor at the time when both of those were still in the genome. And we are interested to see um, in the future how, how that happened, why that might have been innocuous, um, or if this led to a selection for loss of one of the genes, in this case, the loss of the paired gene. So we're continuing to work on that. I'd like to move now to a, another short um, little story about work that's currently ongoing in the lab. And this work is all being done by Katie Redding, a uh, graduate student in the lab. So this work looks at a group of insects called the hemipterans. These are the piercing sucking insects, um, like aphids or stink bugs that some of you may be familiar with. Hemipterans are a close outgroup to the holometabolous insects. And the reason that we have been looking at a number of different species from the order hemiptera is that a lot of work on parallel gene function has been done, a lot of comparative work has been done in other holometabolous insects where many but not all of the Drosophila peril genes are conserved and where many but not all of the Drosophila peril genes do function in peril patterning. We were wondering if in this more basally branching and close outgroup to holometabolous insects, if that was also the case. And Katie has been working on the model, or sort of developing model or emerging model system, the milkweed bug Oncopeltis fasciatus, that's uh, this really pretty insect here. Um, to ask these questions. So the first thing Katie did was she isolated the orthologs of all of the nine Drosophila peril genes, and she also isolated the orthologs of closely related family members of all of those peril genes, and looked at the expression pattern. And what she saw was that these peril orthologs were not expressed in a peril pattern in Oncopeltis. Rather, they were expressed segmentally, similar to segment polarity genes in Drosophila. And I'm just showing you two examples here, but it's, it's true for all of them. And, and this work was published in 2019. So we can see six stripes of Oncopeltis paired in blastoderm embryos, and then these closely packed stripes um, in the anterior portion of the segment addition zone. Here's another example, Oncopeltis sloppy paired, which is expressed in seven stripes in the blastoderm. And then segmentally in every stripe, this would look exactly like engrailed, which um, you may see, a, I may show a staining of engrailed in a moment. Um, and these results were very similar to what was found in Ariel Chipman's lab. We then asked about the function of these genes. Maybe they were expressed in every segment, but only functioned in alternating segments. That could have also been possible. So Katie used parental RNAi to knock down expression individually of each of these nine peril gene orthologs, and none of them showed a peril phenotype. The only ones that showed any phenotype are the ones shown here. So this is using now invected and engrailed-like gene um, as a marker. This is a wild-type um, 
germ band embryo after knockdown of odd or paired, KD saw either a loss, decrease, or just sort of generalized expression of invected, whereas when sloppy paired was knocked down, she saw that each um, invected stripe was a little broadened, and that corresponds with the location of the sloppy paired stripes right behind or right posterior to the invected stripes, so probably acting as a repressor. So overall, even though by qPCR these genes were completely knocked down, um, Katie never saw any peril phenotypes. So did this mean that Oncopeltis and perhaps hemipterans or more basally branching insects don't use a peril mechanism at all? That could be possible, after all, for those of you who remember the original Newsline Volhard and Vichaus screen, the peril phenotype was surprising. It wasn't expected. But we knew that, in fact, Oncopeltis do deploy a peril patterning mechanism because of work done by Denise Rezamaz um, that was published in 2009 that we reproduced here. Um, so this is Katie's figure showing that E75A is actually expressed in a peril pattern. So we, here we see two stripes rather than six in the blastoderm stage of E75A. And you can see these nicely spaced stripes. And E75A is also expressed in a peril pattern in the developing um, segment addition zone, as shown here. Interestingly, E75A does not have any role in segmentation in Drosophila. So what did this mean? Um, did this mean that E75A was the sole segmenta peril segmentation gene um, in this species, in Oncopeltis? And we thought that was very unlikely. Drosophila and other holometabolous insects utilize seven to nine peril genes. How could Oncopeltis possibly be doing the same job with just one peril gene? And all of the Drosophila peril genes were non-peril in Oncopeltis, so this made us wonder if there was a wholesale swap, a whole group of new peril genes that were different between Oncopeltis and Drosophila. And if that were the case, would it be possible that this Oncopeltis mode was actually the ancestral mode of peril patterning? And I'll tell you that we don't exactly have the answer to this yet, although we, we do think that it's the case. But in order to investigate this, we obviously couldn't take a candidate gene approach. All the candidate genes come from Drosophila, and Katie had already tested all of the peril gene orthologs and their family members, and, and, and those weren't the right genes. So what Katie decided to do was um, a pretty brave, I think, um, in C2 hybridization screen. So shown here at the top left is a, is a gel um, at three different time points. At an early time point when E75A is not yet expressed, at, at the time point when E75A is expressed strongly, and then at a later time point when E75A decreases in expression, we colloquially call this off on off, although of course it's not completely off. Um, and what Katie did was she sequenced RNA from those three time points and then clustered all of the genes that were expressed um, in, different, in, di in, in different sets. Um, and in this black box here, you see the genes that are expressed in an E75A-like pattern, that off on off. And she, start, and she started to screen um, potentially transcription factor encoding genes um, by in situ hybridization in Oncopeltis. So here's an example of how this looks. Katie has so far screened through about 50 genes. Some of them have very specific expression patterns. A lot of them are expressed quite ubiquitously in the Oncopeltis embryo. And although it's very preliminary, Katie has recently found one gene that's expressed in a payroll pattern. I won't mention what that gene is yet because it's still pretty preliminary, but it does look like it has a peril pattern and peril function, um, and it is also not a peril gene um, in Drosophila. But in order to actually be sure about whether these genes have peril function or not, um, we wanted to be able to use CRISPR-Cas9 and not just rely on RNAi because there are potential um, problems with RNAi that you could, that you could um, not get a fully penetrant phenotype from using that approach. So Katie um, decided to develop CRISPR-Cas9 CRISPR technology for Oncopeltis. She first chose the, Drosop the white gene because of its famous role in Drosophila as an eye color gene um, and was able to establish CRISPR-Cas9 mutagenesis with white. She got many bioallelic hits in the G0 embryos that are really nice mosaics of orange and white color on their bodies. 
But it turned out that white was homozygous lethal in Oncopeltis, so it was not good as a genetic marker. Um, but Katie didn't give up, and she next tried um, an RNAi screen with a whole bunch of different eye color genes and found one that did not cause lethality and chose to generate CRISPR mutants for the vermilion gene, which are shown here. So she got three independent mutations of vermilion. Each has been established as a very healthy, true breeding line. And the eye color is pretty cool. So the wild type eye color is dark black in Oncopeltis, and the vermilion mutants are these bright red vermilion eyes. So these vermilion mutants are available. We're very excited to share them with the community. Um, if anyone is interested, please let me know. Um, this would be the first um, visible genetic marker useful for genetic tools um, in Oncopeltis, and it also has been mapped because it's on the X chromosome. So um, that also is a, is a really cool result that Katie got. Okay, so in the last two minutes, I'll try to put these, these findings and our thoughts about these into a, into a sort of broader perspective. So a lot of times we think about a simple genotype to phenotype transition as shown here in the, top, in the top of this slide. And of course, when we see a phenotypic variation, a morphological novelty, and that's what a lot of people do in the EvoDevo field, we can trace that back and find a genetic variation or a change that has occurred in the genotype. In our case, um, we've been looking at the genes involved in insect, insect segmentation and peril patterning, in fact, in regulation of engrailed stripes. And what we're finding is that the Drosophila straight line of all those genes that were found in Drosophila, those are not the only genes that are able to generate a, a segmented insect embryo, peril stripes, or peril patterning, sorry, or um, alternate engrailed stripes. And this phenomenon, we're, we're thinking about it as phenotypic stability. This is very similar to developmental systems drift, uh, something described by John True and my colleague, Eric Haig, who I don't know where he is now in the audience. Um, but what we're seeing is that the genotypes can change, but this phenotype of insect segmentation remains stable. So I've shown you today, and there are other examples, but what I've shown you today is that in one case, Gooseberry took on a pear rule like expression pattern, enabling the loss of paired from the genome. In another case, Futz has changed from a Hox gene to a pear rule gene, and this single gene has changed, but it's gone through multiple different steps, and in a stepwise way that we can sort of reconstruct, taken on a pear rule function in Drosophila, but may have many other functions in other extant species. And finally, the result that we're actually the most excited about is that there has been a change of multiple genes, both gain and loss of peril genes between Oncopeltis and Drosophila. We don't know yet exactly where all of those changes happened, and we are not sure which mode of peril patterning is ancestral. So I'll end with a few just words of advice, some lessons learned. Our approach overall for all these years has been to address, to, to use functional studies to address mechanism. And we have also taken the approach um, in insects to sample insects across insect phylogeny. So this is a little different from most labs, I think, in, in um, EvoDevo. Insects are certainly great systems for genetic analysis. But what we are seeing is that, first of all, not all insects are great model systems, and we have tried insects that we've dropped because they were um, not possible to rear in the lab. But we've also seen that we can learn a lot about any type of system, even without developing it, developing it to the level of a model species of Drosophila. So we can pick and choose the insects that we want to sample across phylogeny, and we can pick and choose the types of experiments we want to do to answer specific questions. And we have found that using multiple species within the same lab greatly improves the efficiency of protocol development because folks can help each other with lots of little tips that are definitely essential when you're developing new techniques like even in C2 hybridization that can be really challenging in a new species. We think our work shows, um, inconsistent with work from many other people, that the Drosophila rules don't apply to all insects. Um, overall, 
Our work has been driven by curiosity, and each result leads to a new question. As Alison Heffer said when she started this Evo Devo approach in the lab, nature will always surprise us. Our, our experiments are hypothesis driven, but they're also discovery driven, and we're not always sure what we're going to find when we do the experiments. So just in the last minute, I do want to say I know there are lots of people out there who are younger than me, lots of trainees out there. And I want to just emphasize that there's not one path to success in this career. There are lots of different ways to do this career and to be successful and to be very fulfilled for yourself. You for sure have to work hard. Anything in this career is a lot of hard work and you have to love the work. You have to really be dedicated and think it's fun to do, but really you can do it your own way. And with that in mind, I want to thank the many lab members who have contributed to this work over the years. I've mentioned the specific people whose work has contributed to this talk today. Um, also thank the funders, um, previously, uh, previous funding from NSF for this Evo Devo work, currently funded by uh, NIH. And we also have another more applied project in the lab funded by the USDA and Ebony Argas, who's here at this meeting, gave a poster on this a couple of days ago that you may have seen. So I will stop there. Thank you.